Hey there, and welcome to RPG Horror Stories with D&D Doge. In today's video, we have a story about that guy meeting the consequences of his It's What My Character Would Do actions. A story about how a player's sick fantasy destroys a Dungeons & Dragons campaign, and much more. Now, with the content in some of today's stories, we're going to need some protection from the psychic damage that they are sure to induce. So to help with that, here is Alice. There we go. Now that we have been blessed, let's get right into the stories. Argumentative, it's what my character would do player, can't understand consequences. By Reddit user, another sad trans girl. I blame myself for this one. I've seen her as a player twice, but I still let her join when she asked. Let's call her Cece. Following a last-minute dropout before the start of a campaign, I open-posted for friends who might be willing to join, and Cece jumped at it immediately. Cece had pre-made a character, and the backstory was… something. Very edgy stuff. And I had to step in at a few parts. You know. No, your first level character hasn't killed a troop of the greatest criminals in the world, etc. Also, the player character doesn't want to be here, doesn't trust people, and will lose control if he's forced to do something. So like, if your character doesn't want to be involved and can't be forced to be involved, I don't really know what to do. But she assured me that it would be fine. Again, my fault for trusting her. We had already done a Group Session Zero with the rest of the party, so Cece and I had a last-minute private one-on-one -on -one to catch her up and get her involved. The location? Baldur's Gate, the City of Blood, notoriously violent and corrupt. I tell her this, and that's when her player character arrives. The gate guides try to escort her around the city to help her find a place of safety and whatnot. Her character refuses the aid, because I had told the player about the city, but not the player character. But the player character thinks he can handle it. Okay then. I roll on the encounter table. This sounds good. Maybe it'll knock some sense into her. Cece's character is cornered by a kingpin and his guard of eight bandits who saw the easy target. What does this first level do surrounded by eight enemies alone? Fight, of course. And lose, of course. I know the city wouldn't have mercy, but it's session zero, so I'll be kind. He's at one hit point, restrained, and prone, so of course he insults and threatens them. They take her character's stuff, to which she complains, so I laid it out for her. She ignored three separate warnings. She had three chances to not be a loose cannon, but she did so at every chance. Oh, but it wasn't Cece, no. It was her character that did that, and if I take her character's stuff, he'll just fight until he's dead. I decide to leave her with some of her important belongings, but in no uncertain terms, I lay it out. If she or her character tries this again, I'm not going to pull any punches. Skip to Session 2. The party is investigating a tavern. There's going to be the first combat encounter tonight. But before that, Something magical happens, and the character has a panic attack, I guess, and starts breaking into rooms looking for the source of the magic. The tavern owner chases after her and warns her that she can't do that, but Cece's character ignores him. The owner calls the guards over, very dangerous looking guards, but Cece's character ignores them and breaks into a second room. The guard blocks him, and Cece's character insults them. Motherfuck. Okay. Everyone, roll initiative. Combat lasts one round. The guard that goes first crits. The first combat roll of the game, and it's a crit. It's also a straight killing blow. Not downed, dead. I fudge it because I'm an idiot who can't keep my threats, so Cece's character is downed. The rest of the players spend their round doing something sensible, pleading and convincing the tavern staff to stand down, and seeing as the problem child is unconscious, they comply. Combat over. The healer heals her character up, and then the character insults and threatens the guards again. 
Hmm. All right, idiot. Roll intimidation. Congrats. You pissed them off. And they punch you for good measure. CC then begins arguing the rules with me, and I start to explain how I'm playing Raw and how some combat rules are a common misconception. And she won't shut up. She won't stop interrupting me. She's arguing with me when I haven't even started explaining things. It then escalates into yelling. She leaves, and I dump her from the party. There's an awkward silence, but the game soon picks back up, and everyone has a great time. The planned combat encounter runs us an hour late, but we're all having so much fun that we stay up late to finish it. No fudging here, with most of the party rolling death saves or on their last leg, the last ditch attack does exactly enough to kill the big bad and win the encounter. I've never had a party cheer before, but we were so damn excited for how tense it was. Oh yeah, and the problem player kicked me from her campaign in Retribution. But the weird thing is, she's not a mechanically bad DM. Now, I'm usually a proponent of solving in-game issues out of game, but by the sounds of it, in regards to Cece arguing with OP about combat after she murder hoboed all over the place, I don't think that would have achieved anything. By the sounds of it, OP made numerous concessions to try and keep Cece happy, while not completely breaking the world he wanted to run, like fudging a role to not kill her character outright, or allowing her character to keep primary items after being accosted by a kingpin and his goons. Hell, OP even allowed that freakout at the inn, and after her character was downed and revived, she started right back up again. I can only imagine how hard it would be to run a game with a player like that, and with the way Cece was, I am not surprised to hear that she kicked OP out of her game. But at that point, would you really want to go back to her game with that target on your back? Though, I mean, it would have been good for me. I mean, more content. But that's besides the point. It's good to hear that OP and the rest of the group did have what sounds to be like a phenomenal time after this, though. So, at least there is somewhat of a happy ending. Let's move on. But before we do, I need to give a quick content warning for this next one, as it contains role-played SA. So, if you would like to skip this story, you can go to this timecode on the screen. Otherwise, let's get into it. The rogue that wanted a reward from female NPC, what's turned really nasty, by Reddit user DMTOR. So, this was some time ago and was during my first group in D&D, while playing the adventure Lost Mine of Fandelver. There were five players, but the only one that really matters for this story is the half-elven rogue. For most of the adventure, nothing bad happened, but during the end, the rogue would ask the DM, regularly, about the servant of Timora, Sister Gariel. Now, the DM used Google to find a picture of the NPC, and everyone could agree that the pictures were of a beautiful woman, something the rogue exclaimed with a large grin. For most of the adventure, the game went fine, and we completed most of it without any problem, though it was at the very end, when our deeds were done, that the rogue wished to date Sister Gariel. Now, for safe measures, the rogue used his high stealth to sneak outside of the tavern when the rest of the party was sleeping to meet Gariel at her house. Here, he tried to persuade himself inside to talk with a flask of wine. To be honest, we honestly just thought that he was trying to get laid, but it turned real nasty at this point. The dialogue between the player and the DM went something like this. I sit down and pour her and myself a glass of wine, whilst trying to impress her. After rolling a charisma roll, the DM tells the player that she is flattered but not interested romantically. The DM then tells the rogue that Gariel has a girlfriend in the Harpers, so he shouldn't feel bad for not getting her interested. The rogue then looks at the DM and grins towards us, saying that this was good because it meant that she was pure and probably had not been sullied by other men. This was when there was nervous laughter around the table, everyone staring in silence at the scenario playing out before us. The player then tells the DM that he is not leaving this house without getting laid, so he better buckle over 
and give him his reward without a fuss. The DM then tells Rogue that nothing is going to happen, in which case the Rogue grins wildly, telling the DM that he moves up to Gariel with the bottle of wine, slamming it into her head, and forcing her to the ground to sexually assault her. The DM then tries to fade to black, but the Rogue will have none of it, explaining how he uses his knives to pin her down while forcing his way, giving us the most graphic explanation of how he brutalizes this NPC. This visibly made some of us and the DM uncomfortable. After the deed was done, and having killed the NPC, the Rogue uses his stealth to run away and get back to the party. The next day, the player looks us all straight in the face and says that it's a horrible world and that he couldn't understand how anyone could do such a thing with an enormous shit-eating grin. The guards then come to get the character. The rogue tries to explain it away, but the DM will have none of it. The two start to argue out of game, and it becomes very clear that we would not be continuing the story. We ended the adventure there, and the DM stopped playing D&D for some time. Holy God, there is just so much wrong with this whole thing. First, the moment the rogue wanted to do anything of that sort, it should have been up to the DM to put a stop to it right there, especially with how it was making everyone uncomfortable. And then, if the player pushed the issue, just kick him out. And the fact that the DM let him keep going, and even entertained a fade to black for it, that DM needed to grow a spine, put his foot down, and tell that player flat out no. This player was either trying to be super edgy, or he actually harbored fantasies of doing that type of thing. And, in my opinion, someone like that should have been kicked immediately, no question. So, I would tell OP that it was probably a good thing that this game fell apart, and I would suggest finding different people to play with. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that thinks that we need a kitty palate cleanser after that one. There. That is a bit better. Now, let's move on to the next one. Was I too nitpicky on these house rules? By Reddit user, Atorigas. I was looking to join a game a while back, and found a post on looking for game. The post said that there were some house rules like weapon and armor durability, but didn't specify much else. This should have been a red flag already, but I figured, what the hell? Let's see what it's all about. Fast forward a little bit, and I am added to the Discord server. We are told that there will be a Session Zero, and to start getting ideas ready for a character. Though, there are no house rules listed anywhere, but I figure we will discuss it during Session Zero. Some people are chomping at the bit though, and talk with the DM one-on-one -on -one to get their character set up. After everyone else sets up their characters before Session Zero, the DM reaches out to me to set up my character with him, so we set a day and time to do a one-on-one. -on -one. At the time, I had my sights set on a tanky wizard, similar to an Eldritch Knight. When I explain that I'm going Fighter 1, Wizard X, he tells me that I won't be able to tank effectively because I don't have an extra attack. I'm pretty familiar with 5e, and just assumed that he doesn't understand my build, so I kind of ignore this. It's at this time that he's pushing me to be a healer, because no one else has healing. When I ask about the bard, he says that the bard isn't going to heal. This frustrated me a bit, because the group had told me that they don't care about team composition, and actually said that if we don't have a healer, then we just have to play smart. We also didn't have a tank, so I thought I could at least do that. I tell the DM that I don't want to play Paladin because I'm playing one in another campaign, and I don't understand why it was only my responsibility to fill the gap that the other players left. Anyways, to get to the house rules, we are talking about Wizard and how to make it work. We talk about Armor Class, and I tell him that I can't pick up a shield until I can take a feat because I need a free hand to hold my spell focus. That's when I learn that there are no spell focuses in this game, and that we always need to use components, and those components, most of the time, are consumed when casting. This alone almost made me pick a different class, 
as there's no way I wanted to keep track of how much thread and batshit I have at all times. I'm very put off, but I figure that a lot of spells I planned on taking did not even have spell components, so I didn't switch my class. Yet. We discuss more about the wizard, and I tell him some of the spells I plan to take when leveling up that will help me be tanky, but then he mentions that I have to find every spell, that in his game, wizards don't learn free spells on level up, that they only get spells when they copy them into their spellbook, and he claims that it wouldn't make sense any other way. So I swap classes. I ask him if the other wizard in the party knew about this, and he says yes, and they were fine with it, but I was most definitely not. I should have left the table here, as he also told me about his weapon and armor durability. Magic weapons could break after use and or natural ones, and about the encumbrance mechanics, but I didn't. There was never a session zero. We never discussed the game or introduced ourselves to each other. I ended up making a paladin, very much to my dismay. Then later, we learned about more rules as we played. Seemingly random things he'd make up on the go, like our Aarakocra not being able to end her turn in the air. Everyone else in the party was very okay with these changes, though. Was I being too nitpicky? House rules can be fine in a game like Dungeons & Dragons, but they should all be listed before the game even starts, and the player should be able to know about them before making their characters. That way, nothing can sneak up on a player after they already invested into the game. Though, part of me thinks that this DM was probably just making stuff up on the fly as situations popped up. At this point, it's understandable that OP doesn't like these house rules, but it sounds like the rest of the players don't mind them, so it just might be better for OP to find another game that they vibe with more. At least, that is my opinion. Let's move on. And as it is Friday, it's time we cap off the week with a D&D glory story. DM Expectations vs. Player's Reality By Reddit user, Hot Republic 4096 I play in a loosey-goosey campaign that you can drop in and out of whenever. I haven't played for a few weeks, but I do enjoy it when I do. I come back in to find the team at a tavern when they're approached by a woman who needs our help recovering an artifact that may or may not be a ticking time bomb. The job is simple. Go into the museum during their grand reveal of said artifact, figure out guard patterns, turn off alarms, and or get passes to not set off the alarms, then go back at night, grab the artifact, and get out. Easy. The actual events. We go into the museum, forget about the alarms and guards, ask to buy the artifact, fail, and proceed to spill a lot of milk everywhere. So we try to hide in a taxidermied Allosaurus, fail, and two-thirds are kicked out, and the remaining third hides until nightfall. The two that are kicked out, incredibly low intelligence characters, make a foolproof plan to hire a gnome and a goblin to strip naked, get greased up, and then be thrown through a window to then play the game of Don't Get Caught as a distraction. Meanwhile, we break in through the roof and mine through the walls to get to the artifact. All is going well, apart from a guard that we have trapped in the toilet, as we are told not to kill anyone, but the plan always comes first. Due to DM rolls, the greased up naked short people are causing an absolute ruckus, and the other guards are having a hard time getting a hold of them. This is why I love Dungeons and Dragons. Well, that is certainly one way to pull off a heist. I really love stories like this, where a serious situation and careful planning turns out to be something that would likely play out on an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Imagining the absolute chaos of two small folk running around and slipping out of the guard's hands just makes me laugh, and I give my stamp of approval. But that is all I have for you today. As always, I appreciate all of you, and may your hands be nimble and quick if you ever have to chase down a greased-up gnome. Until next time.